<laughs> the blue? Which bar? Well, oh. turn off original sound. Oh. Yeah, it was turn on. And it's then it's on. Yeah, it's it's uh yeah. yeah, when it's when it's on, it's blue, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. It's a little bit, bit counterintuitive. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's what mine says too. Good morning, Nina. Trish, morning Richard. There. You're in, Betty. Good morning. Still have your tree up. Tree up. I've never left it up for the 12 days. That's right. Good morning, Edith. So that's what Oh, you want? There. We what see you, Edith. And your coach. Hi. <laughs> Pardon? Yeah. And your coach. Yep, she's doing a good job here. Morning, Thanks. Lauren. Good morning. Oh, no. Okay, so that's. And then I just set that down then. And, okay. Very good. Thank you very much. <laughs> No, I think I, I think that's okay there. Yeah. Extra cookies, extra cookies for Lauren. Oh, she brought me over a muffin. It was really good. Morning, Dad. Morning, morning. Lauren. Morning. Good morning. John here. Hi. Run Roxburgh, seven six one seventy five eighty eight. Very good. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. There's Good morning to Brenda Harris. Good morning. Good morning, all. Here we are. Thank you. Good morning to Elaine. Good morning. Who's just signing in? There we are. Take care, we have a good crowd this morning. That's wonderful. <clears throat> well, if Douglas has finished playing the organ, it must be 10 o'clock. <laughs> 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 I do that for the people who are OCD. <laughs> Present company excluded. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Welcome, everyone, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you. Want to get one chance to say it? Might as well do it today. <laughs> now, uh, this is Cheryl speaking, and we'll have some time again at the end of the service for a chat. First, I'd like to thank everyone taking part today. Douglas, uh, Patricia, Edith, Corey, Maggie, and Alex, and our guest preacher is Eric Prue. Does anyone have a testimony to share today? Hi, Cheryl. It's Liz here. Yes, I have a, I have a testimony. I'm Thank very, you. I'm a very proud aunt. I'm not going to be able to do this. My niece in Spain, who works for the Foreign Commonwealth Development Office, um, servicing British nationals overseas, has been given the prestigious award of an MBE, which is Member of the British Empire. Oh, wow. my, my chest is just beaming. So I'm very, very proud of her. Yeah, yeah that's great. She has a hundred staff that she oversees, and uh, the calls with the COVID, she works in a call center, went from 2,000 a day to 10,000 a day, and she oh my goodness. a fabulous job. Wow. So I just found out on Thursday, so I'm pretty proud. Mm -hmm. oh, yes, that's wonderful news. <laughs> way to go. <laughs> so she was part of the, the Queen's uh, uh, honors list, and that's yes. fabulous yes. news. Yeah. <laughs> How she gets it, I'm not quite sure, because I guess she's not going to Buckingham Palace at the moment. <laughs> well, I'm sure they'll find right. a way. Yeah. Wonderful news. Yeah. Wonderful. Good morning, Devin. Morning. How are you? How is everybody? Yeah. New Year. I think we're fine. So are there any birthdays this week? Any New Year's babies in the house? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, any anniversaries this week? No winter weddings either. All right, well, let's move on. The hymn today is going to be 811, Standing at the Portal. In announcements, um, session will meet on Tuesday, the 5th of January by Zoom, starting at uh, committees at 630. And then uh, in other announcements, our information reports are due for the annual meeting this week. Annual meeting is going to be in February. The reports are due this week. Um, we're going to do the annual meeting on Zoom and by phone, uh, which we are allowed to do. We don't have to be in person. And it's going to be on uh, February 7th, just after the service. And so we'll make an announcement about that as we get closer. Uh, we have three opportunities for small groups to meet and talk virtually. Uh, the Tuesday group in the afternoon discusses the sermon or the message. Uh, that's with Devin Wilkins. Wednesday evening Bible study and prayer is resuming this week. Janet, is that true? Yes, thank you. And finally, we have fellowship time on Thursday evening at 7 o'clock. And that's uh, by contacting Douglas. You can join us. Um, thank you, as always, for your gifts, for your tithes, your offerings, and your, your time as volunteers over the years. It's truly appreciated. And as you know, we have many ways for you to give. If you would like to send an e-transfer, it goes to finance at stpaulspeterborough.ca. We also have an offering slot. Uh, in our doorway, you can give through car, etc. So thank you all so very much, and I wish you God's blessings on this new year. Here is our guest preacher, Eric Crew. Eric, you'll have to unmute your phone or your uh, Zoom. There. Good morning, St. Paul's. Come on, St. Paul's family. Let's rejoice at a new year a new opportunity to shine our light and a new perspective on who we are as a community of Christ ones. 2021 holds great promise as we roll out across the globe vaccines meant to halt the most terrifying pandemic in a hundred years. Donald Trump is going, if not quite gone, and our neighbors to the south can begin to reclaim political predictability 
and perhaps a civility once more. We say all of this with confidence because we worship a God who has a plan and who loves us. We know as Christ ones that our God will cause hearts to change and goodness, kindness, compassion, justice, righteousness, and love to once more prevail across the land. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for bringing us through this past year and to the brink of a new era, an era devoid of COVID-19 and all of its fearsome consequences of death, bankruptcy, debilitation, distrust, and isolation from each other. Families have been ripped apart, fortunes have been lost, children have been orphaned, and debts have skyrocketed. We have gained a new respect for frontline workers who clean our health care facilities, our long-term care facilities, and our workplaces. We have new respect for our nurses and doctors and orderlies and administrators who staff our medical facilities and heal us. We have learned the true value of our teachers and other educators and daycare workers who have kept our children safe and pursuing an education without significant disruption. We have adopted new technology, which is keeping us connected and able to worship together, though apart. While we count our losses, we also count our blessings that we have received through your grace. While we have been apart and without a minister, we have managed to stay connected and grow over three continents, over thousands of miles, and over much trial and error with our profound and newfound media technology. Our Sunday Zoom attendance is up. Our givings are up. And I think our morale is up as well, Lord. All of this we know has been because of your love of us and your grace. The Holy Spirit has led our deliberations and melded our minds to make us stronger than before. Thank you, Lord, for these blessings. We are ready to move into 2021 with optimism and hope because our strength is through you and your grace. We pray together now the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy be name. Thy, thy, thy kingdom come. come. Thy will be done on earth as, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. And we forgive our debtors. And, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Happy New Year. This is Patricia Mills. This morning, please join me in singing hymn number 811, verses 1, 2, and 3, Standing at the Portal. Standing at the portal of the opening year, words of comfort meet us, Hushing every fear Spoken through the silence By God's loving voice Tender, strong, and faithful Making us rejoice Onward then and fear not Children of the day For God's word shall never Never pass away. I, your God, am with you. Do not be afraid. I will help and strengthen. 
strengthen, do not be dismayed, for I will uphold you with my own right hand. You are called and chosen in my sight to stand. Onward then and fear not, children of the day, for God's word shall never Never pass away. God will not forsake us and will never fail. God's eternal covenant ever will prevail. Resting on this promise, what have we to fear? God is all sufficient for the coming year. Onward then and fear not, children of the day, for God's word shall never, never pass away. Thank you, Pat. That's not only a beautiful hymn, but it's been sung beautifully by you. Thank you. Let us pray. Lord, we raise our hands today in blessing of our offerings that were placed before you, and we pray that you will multiply them and use them for your glory and the work here on earth, which we perform as your disciples. May our tithes and offerings be acceptable in your sight. Amen. And now we're going to have the readings. Okay. We have to check that Edith is unmuted. Go ahead, Edith, if you're unmuted. You're still muted, Edith. You have to press a button somehow to unmute. Hang on, folks. Bruce, do you have a just, just a glitch. Bruce, you'll know what Edith is working with. Do you have any suggestions what to push? Press it and it does nothing does it happens. There, there you go. go. We hear oh, you I now. Hope. Okay, I better quit swearing now. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, everybody, and happy new year again. Uh, this is Edith's story, and I'm reading from um, Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 23 from the Good News Bible. And it's the um, escape to Egypt. After the wise men had left, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph and said, Herod will be looking for a child in order to kill him. So get up, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt and stay there until I tell you to leave. Joseph got up, took the child and the mother, and left during the night for Egypt, where he stayed until Herod died. This was done to make, to make come true what the Lord had said through the prophet, I called my son out of Egypt. When Herod realized that the visitors from the east had tricked him, he was furious. He gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its neighborhood, and its neighborhood who were two years old and younger. This was done in accordance with what he had learned from the visitors about the time when the star had appeared. In this, <clears throat> excuse me, in this way the prophet, in this, what, in this way, what the prophet Jeremiah had said came true. A sound is heard in Ramah and the sound of bitter weeping. Rachel was crying for her children she refused to be comforted, for they were dead. But Her after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and the mother, and go back to the land of Israel, because those who tried to kill the child are dead. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went back to Israel. 
But when Joseph heard that Archelaus had succeeded his father Herod as king of Judah, he was afraid to go there. He was given more instructions in a dream. So he went to the province of Galilee and made his home in a town called Nazareth. And so what the prophets had said came true. He will be called Nazarene. So ends the reading of his holy word. Good morning and Happy New Year. This is Corey. Our next reading is coming from the book of Exodus, chapter 15, verses 11 to 18. This reading is a part of the Song of Moses, and at this point in the song, the children of Israel have crossed the Red Sea, and the Pharaoh's armies have been destroyed. However, they still need to make the journey toward the Promised Land. Lord, who among the gods is like you? Who is like you, wonderful in holiness? Who can work miracles and mighty acts like yours? You stretch out your right hand, and the earth swallowed our enemies. Faithful to your promise, you led the people you had rescued. By your strength, you guided them to your sacred land. The nations have heard, and they tremble with fear. The Philistines are seized with terror. The leaders of Edom are terrified. Moab's mighty men are trembling. The people of Canaan lose their courage. Terror and dread fall upon them. They see your strength, O Lord, and stand helpless with fear. Until your people have marched past, the people you set free from slavery. You bring them in and plant them on your mountain the place that you, Lord, have chosen for your home, the temple that you yourself have built. You, Lord, will be king forever and ever. So ends this reading. Good morning, everybody. It's Maggie and Alex here. Um, this is our final reading, which is Psalm 10, verses 11 to 18 from the Good News Translation. The wicked say to themselves, God doesn't care. He has closed his eyes and will never see me. Oh Lord, punish those wicked people. Remember those who are suffering. How can the wicked despise God and say to themselves, he will not punish me? But you do see, you take notice of trouble and suffering and are always ready to help. The helpless commit themselves to you you have always helped the needy. Uh, break the power of wicked and evil people. Punish them for the wrong they have done until they do it no more. The Lord is king forever and ever. Those who worship other gods will vanish from his land. You will listen, O Lord, to the prayers of the lowly. You will give them courage. You will hear the cries of the oppressed and the orphans. You will judge in their favor so that mortals may cause terror no more. Here ends the reading. Thank you, readers. Let us pray. Lord, may the words from my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you today. Amen. Amen. Last week, Randy gave us a superior account of the biblical event of the visit by the wise men from the East and told us about the significance of this event in Jesus' life. The wise men had journeyed for over two years to reach the Christ child, and Mary and Joseph were still in the town of Bethlehem. They had not journeyed back to their original home in Galilee yet. There's no biblical explanation for why they were still in Judea, other than perhaps the Romans who occupied Palestine prevented them from migrating back since they were now in the ancestral lands of David and had been accounted for there. But after the wise men left, Joseph was visited in a dream 
by an angel who told him of imminent danger from Herod and told him to take the little family that he had and flee to Egypt that day. This was the first of several moves by his family until Jesus was approximately 30 years of age and began his ministry by reading a passage from the scroll of the book of Isaiah in the local temple, proclaiming himself as the subject of the prophecy. This so angered the, Philistine, the Pharisees and Sadducees and elders of his town that they formed a mob and were about to throw Jesus off a cliff outside of town. But Jesus deftly slipped away in the hysteria and confusion of the mob. This time he was on the move alone, no family. This event landed Jesus in Capernaum, a seaside town on Lake Galilee, where he began to assemble his disciples and build a ministry and a reputation as a healer. Think of just these few events and the number of times God intervened to cause migration or movement of people. The star appeared in the west sky and attracted wise men from the east to journey for two years. Romans had conquered Palestine in order to census, disrupting the lives of thousands of people. Who planted that mad idea in some Roman general's mind one night? Herod felt threatened by the talk of a new king born in Judea and ordered the unthinkable the slaughter of innocent children. This sealed his fate and place in history books and prompted Joseph to move his family to Egypt. Why Egypt? We're not told, but perhaps he had relatives there, left over from the time the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt. Not all Jews left with Moses. At any rate, Alexandria would have been an excellent city in the fertile Nile Delta to raise a son. Alexandria, even then, had a magnificent library known throughout the Mediterranean for its repository of knowledge and scholarship. Jesus no doubt benefited from that. Maybe it explains how a carpenter's child, years later, impressed teachers in the temple in Jerusalem with his answers to their questions. That was during another migration after the annual festival of the Passover. Do you see how seemingly unrelated events and acts by individuals and societies as a whole in response to emotions, intentions, customs, and cultural norms can cause us to move both physically and spiritually, from the people we are or seem to be destined to be, to be somebody else entirely. The story of God's people is definitely one of movement. Throughout the Bible, we read stories of people on the move. Abram started the long journey out of Ur of Chaldee. Joseph persuaded his family to move to the protection of Egypt during a famine, which led to over 400 years of slavery for his descendants in Egypt. Moses led the people of Israel out of Egypt and into the desert for 40 years at God's instructions. After Jesus' ascension, the disciples scattered around the Roman Empire Paul took off on various missionary journeys, and the last book in the Bible finds John exiled on the Isle of Patmos in the Mediterranean Sea. The most famous refugee of all, of course, was Jesus himself. After he began his ministry, he never had a home of his own again. Every night, he was dependent on someone else's hospitality for a place to lay his head. 
Some people willfully choose to move, perhaps to follow a passion or in perfection of a skill or talent or an unmistakable call from God. Many others have moved involuntarily as a result of war, famine, or some other massive problem or inescapable issue in their home country. Those who move voluntarily will tell you that they still experience significant challenges related to cultural adaptation and separation from extended family left behind. I can personally testify to this. When I moved my own family here from Africa in 2007, it was one of the most difficult things that I have had to work through in my life. If it wasn't for my sister Nina, that and the rest of the family as well, I don't know how we would have coped. For this, I am eternally grateful. However, forced moves produce even more difficulties as refugees tend to be subject to stereotyping, prejudices, inadequate living conditions, and lack of dignified employment. As churches, we can play a crucial role in easing the burden of new arrivals on our shores. Canada is a land of immigrants, and the Canadian government is actively promoting Canada as a destination for potential migrants from throughout the globe. In stated, its stated goal is to welcome over 400,000 new immigrants in each of the next three years. And its long-term aim is to grow Canada's population to 100 million by the year 2100. The only way we will achieve this plan is through massive migration to Canada from across the globe. Most of the emphasis will be on getting the best and the brightest from every sending country and culture. But that is going to not meet our quota because every other country looking to keep its workforce numbers healthy will be competing for the same people. Our goals will only be met by opening our doors to substantial numbers of refugees living in displaced persons camps or applying from a country with oppressive laws or widespread poverty. This massive commitment at being the recipient of migration in hitherto unnumbered volumes will bring large people from cultures we see as minorities in our population today. It is highly likely that in the process, Canada will cease to be a Caucasian dominated society as migration from Europe will all but dry up as they too struggle to increase immigration numbers as their birth rates plunge. God is at work crafting the greatest rebalancing of cultures to have ever been faced on this planet. We are situated center stage. Are you ready to be a proactive participant or are you going to be swept away by the incoming tsunami of migrants? As individuals and as a church, how do we apply our Christian faith in this challenge? Can we be compassionate and have loving attitudes that will often be contrary to popular culture? We can use our resources to educate members of our congregation to ensure that they are informed of the issues and have their negative attitudes challenged and corrected. And we can have a prophetic ministry to society at large. We as one voice can speak up for those who are new and struggling to fit in. We can seek creative community solutions and combat entrenched political ideology aimed at preserving the status quo. 
Peterborough is a college town. Every year, our colleges and universities attract over 18,000 migrant students from across the globe to study here, live, and work in our community. Universities and colleges are known as organized migrant communities for the privileged and the fortunate. We are our own epicenter with a front row seat to God's unfolding show. Are we ready? Jesus sent his disciples out to administer to the communities of Galilee with these words found in Luke 9. Take nothing with you for the trip. No walking stick, no beggar's bag, no food, no money, not even an extra shirt. Whenever you are welcomed, stay at the same house until you leave that town. Where people don't welcome you, leave that town and shake the dust off your feet as you go as a warning to them. How would we respond to a stranger knocking at our door and presenting himself like these disciples did? Would we welcome him or reject him? As Christians, we know that this world is not our home. We are told that we are in the world, but that we are not of the world. It is a learning experience before we make our transition to the kingdom of God. While here, we build homes and communities that are a reflection of what we have learned from our collective experience. These communities are meant to be life-giving and life-sustaining. When they are not, people migrate away from them in search of a place that is. God has always been mindful of both the physical and spiritual needs of his people and intervenes when the situation is intolerable. We have outlined today some of the interventions God caused in the Old Testament. If you apply Jesus' instructions and the great commandment to the events and some of the challenges today, surely it is time to consider how God is intervening and remaking his world today. God has compassion for the poor, the marginalized, and the oppressed. He is calling the churches to reach out to such people with his love. All physical suffering is a product of sin at some level. As the world becomes more globalized in its leadership, it is also becoming more secular in its solutions to these problems. God is calling the church to meet the physical needs as well as the spiritual needs of the people who are suffering. It is not enough for the church to just be preaching salvation. It must also become involved in teaching about economic development and social justice to both its own members and also the community at large. The church can no longer stay in its cloistered world and preach from afar to a dwindling audience. It must take its message out as Jesus instructed his disciples and meet the people on their own terms, in their own problems, and come equipped to heal. When we look at the world today, we can see that justice is lacking in most parts of the world. Violence against women and children is widespread even in supposed safe haven areas. The Apostle James said in James 1, verse 27, What God the Father considers to be pure and genuine religion is this, to take care of orphans and widows in their suffering and keep oneself from being corrupted by the world. Throughout the Bible, there is a constant call to seek justice for the oppressed. 
For instance, in Isaiah 1:17, we hear this from the Lord. See that justice is done. Keep those who are oppressed. Help those who are oppressed. Give orphans their rights and defend widows. We are compelled by the command to love your neighbor as yourself in Matthew 22:39, to search out opportunities as the disciples did to heal the broken world one soul at a time. One of the best ways of doing this is to see to it that justice is embedded in the laws of our own society. We are assured in our reading today in Psalms 10, in verses 17 and 18, that you will listen, O Lord, to the prayers of the lowly. You will give them courage. You will hear the cries of the oppressed and the orphans. You will judge in their favor so that mortal men may cause terror no more. We must constantly remind ourselves that God is in charge of his creation and that there is a plan at work, a plan that ultimately does not include pain and suffering for those who love him. We are his hands and feet empowered to serve his purposes here during our time and further the coming of the kingdom of heaven on earth as well as in eternity. That empowerment compels us to go outside of ourselves and migrate to another perspective at the spiritual level and to physically move sometimes in order to accomplish our hopes, dreams, aspirations and callings, which God implants in our hearts and minds from time to time. If we don't listen to these angel voices, then we risk being the victims of the old saying, if you want to hear God laugh, tell him your plan. Amen. We'll now ask Douglas to uh, play a solo. This is Douglas. As we take a moment to consider all that we have heard this morning, I will play another verse of our hymn. Thank you, Douglas. Let us pray again. Lord, you are unmuted. Lord, we are your people. We have seen that throughout history, your hand is in the movement of your people from one place to another and from one perspective to another. You are a God of great mercy and patience with your created children. You have given us free will and dominion over all of the creatures of the world, sky and water. We haven't done a great job as stewards and our free will has led us into more trouble than we would have imagined. Yet your just hand has been there constantly gently guiding us in the righteous path. You have used your capacity as the indwelling spirit to nudge us away from the brink of disaster 
time and time again, and you have led us away from danger with your intercessions. We are a stubborn people, Lord. We learn slowly such traits as intolerance, kindness, compassion, and patience. Yet, with our unwavering faith in you, and with our unceasing love for Jesus as our Savior, and our efforts to love one another as you have loved us, we are still here, standing on the brink of hope in a better year ahead. Bless us, Lord, and keep us mindful of those who are still suffering and who we remember now in silent prayer. Be by their side and hold their hand so that they know your grace is shining on them and your love is enfolding them in their hour of need. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's Douglas again. If you would like to unmute, if you are muted, we'll do our sending forth. It's interesting to note, I have a copy of the Good News Bible here at home, which is the same one that we use in the church. And if you have a copy, uh, you might sometime want to take a look at the beginning of each book. There's an introduction and the introduction to Micah, which the uh, compilers have included, says that this single verse that we will read summarizes much of what the prophets of Israel had to say. So all in one verse, we get it all wrapped up. Here we go. Find the right page. From Micah. What does the Lord require of you? What, what does, does the Lord require of you? you? To seek justice. To, to seek, seek justice. justice. And love kindness. And love, love kindness. kindness. And walk humbly with your God. And walk, and and walk, walk humbly with your God. 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 Go now, as the Spirit of the living God has called you, to be a people who serve, to be a people who comfort, to be a people who love the truth, to be a people who pursue peace, to be a people who forgive, and to be a people who love. And may God always lead and guide you on your way. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. I really, uh, I really enjoyed the message today. We'll have lots to talk about this week. Yes. Thank you, Eric. That was a lovely ceremony. Thank you, Ronnie. Okay. Carol, it's Diana. I saw in the news yesterday where Thomas Simon had passed away. And I'm not sure whether the rest of the congregation know that he had an influence on St. Paul as well. Carol and I had the real pleasure of going to visit in his home. And he did a lot of his thoughts about possibilities for him. When I saw the notice yesterday, it took me back to that day. And I just thought I should share this this morning. Thank you, Janet. Tom was a, a wonderful friend as well, and quite a mentor to me when I was working with Parks Canada, and I really value both his, uh, his uh, abilities and his friendship. So yes, thank you. He was, uh, he'd been in poor health for a little while, but he was a mighty, mighty man. Um, who? Tom Simons. Tom Simons passed away on New Year's Oh, Day. yes. Was he connected to St. Paul's? 
No, he was he was um, an advocate for preservation. Okay. When we were looking for alternatives, no. Oh yes. <clears throat> but yep, um, it's true though, Eric. You know, people move on in spiritually as well, and uh, I'm sure that Tom is busy organizing a Canadian Studies Department in heaven. <laughs> Now, that visit that day was both intimidating and challenging. I've never seen as many books piled up around a hearth before. That was a wonderful home. Me and Christine really, really made that home their own. It's uh, on Park Street, just near Charlotte, to uh, near Gilmore, and uh, it's called March Banks. It was Robertson Davies' home when he was editor of the Peterborough Examiner. It was right beside where John and June Turner lived. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Turner's yeah. were right beside. They were right beside them. Very good friends. Yes, they were. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Douglas. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry, Richard. Say again. I believe uh, he was instrumental in starting uh, University right? Yes. Yeah, he was he the was, first president. He was oh. recruited in 1961. He was the first president and the youngest university president in Canada. Yes, we, we met him in uh, 1963. All the uh, teachers in Peterborough uh, problems in getting fundraising to start Trent University and it hung in the balance seats. Two inspectors, uh, Mr. Nichols together with Dr. Ray, uh, they organized the meeting of all the teachers and asked them to come to the auditorium in which we attended. Or all the teachers were asked to donate one week's worth of salary uh, to the foundation of to start Trent University. And that's wow. really the he absolutely initial, uh, but he was brilliant enough to think of doing that, and he got solid support for the education to do so. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you think about it, back uh, in the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s, Peterborough was a dying collar town. And, uh, the universities and the colleges that came in had more or less saved the city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Sure. something to think about. Yeah. Well, we were both products of that because we had to go to either Queen's University or the University of Toronto to actually get uh, any kind of college or university education. There was nothing really available other than the teacher's college, which we both uh, attended and went from there. Yeah. So a, a pivotal moment. Uh, Peterborough losing all its industrial base, so it was another uh, pivotal moment. So it sort of worked worked both ways. Mm -hmm. Very true, very true. And some of the people on this Zoom call are graduates of Trent University. I was gonna say even within recent years, Tom Simons um, still attended different kind of fundraising events at Trent University, specifically Trail College, he attended quite a few. So I got to meet him a couple times. Very nice. Yeah. 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 Wonderful guy. Cody, I would like to ask you about the situation in uh, UK and I hope that everything is okay with you. Yeah, things are okay with me. Um, they're, we're under uh, lockdown currently and they've delayed the start of in-person classes for taught students until the 25th of January. So uh, Oxford's gonna be a little quiet for the next couple weeks, but I still get to go into my lab and continue my research. And um, so far things are looking still pretty good. Very hopeful, good. especially with the news of the new Oxford vaccine that's supposed to be rolling out tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Of course, because Oxford helped in the development of it all, Oxford students are in first in line to get it, right? <laughs> I wish, but no. 
we'll be going through the proper order of things. Yeah. Us old people will want it first. <laughs> you speak for yourself, Bruce. <laughs> well, I noticed in the United States, all the politicians are getting it. Yep. They sure made sure they stood in first line. Yeah. Maybe that's because too many of them are too old. <laughs> for sure. Uh, I mean, you can still have your marbles in your 80s. Uh, from that's true. That's true. <laughs> you may not be able to find them, but they're there somewhere. <laughs> that's a nice response there. Because all, all of our uh, politicians are leaving the country. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I read somewhere that the founding fathers of the United States were in their 20s and 30s. Could that be correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Life expectancy back then was about 45. Right. I just finished an audio book that was a precursor to Moby Dick and these young kids from where is it? The east coast of the United States are hopping on ships. They've never had any experience. They're in their late teens and they're sailing around the world on whaling ships. And I thought, wow, our workforce is so different today. I wouldn't even think of that just with, in terms of age. You know, today you can't hop on a ship. If you want to get on, you, you probably have to go through about six or eight interviews and, uh, you know, stand in a long queue and everything else. We sure have changed. Yes, we have. Eric? Yes. I have October statement here at the house. That's good. Yes. <laughs> So when you're trying to figure out the book, you'll be able, you'll be wanting it. I don't know how we'll get it to you, but somehow. Well, have you got a pigeon in the area? No, I haven't. No. <laughs> how about a blue jay? <laughs> May have one of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. might work. <laughs> <laughs> we'll figure something out this week, Catherine. Um, okay. Probably we're not going to be able to get anything out of our uh, uh, advisor until about Wednesday. Okay. We'll get a print out and maybe I can even uh, get him to do a little bit of the work. Okay. All I'll right. I'll give him a call tomorrow anyway. Okay. Because you got to have your report in this week, don't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> nag, 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 nag. <laughs> so do you, Catherine. Huh? So do you. No, no, he's he's in charge of the trustees this year. Oh. oh, oh, oh. oh Aren't you lucky? I'll tell you yeah. what, I'll do the mathematics part. You do the written part. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll, we'll switch. <laughs> I'm sharing the wealth. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, very funny. So yes. the reports are due on the 6th on Wednesday, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Oh. Oh. It'll, yes. it'll, be a little, it'll be a little different this year because we're going to have to send a bunch of the reports out by email and then hand deliver uh, the others so that as many people as possible can take part. Usually we just leave them on a table and people pick them up the week before the meeting. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to do a little bit of figuring on that. Well, it's not really something we can publish in St. Paul's Connects, is it? Not really. No. It's a little bit too big. Better to send it as a separate <laughs> attachment, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everybody. Eric, thank you. Was this good? Corey, behave. She never behaved herself.
<laughs> or you, I used to, I used to say to my mom when I was in high school, "Well, I'll see you later, mom. I'm going out," and she'd always say, "Now, sure, I'll be good." <laughs> mom, mom, I'll be magnificent. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good week, everybody. Take care. Peace, everybody.